Hello, I'm Richard Heinberg of Post Carbon Institute, author of Peak Everything and several other books that explore the challenges of energy resource depletion. I'm Julian Darley, author of High Noon for Natural Gas and president of Post Carbon Institute. For the next few minutes, we'll be speaking about an issue of overwhelming national and global significance, our oil supply, what we have now and what we will have in years to come. You may have heard of what some people call the peak oil theory, the understanding that the rate of world oil production will reach a maximum and begin to decline. Calling it a theory is only appropriate if we contrast it with the theory that oil is infinite and our supply will never decrease. But almost no one believes that. No, peak oil is not theoretical. It's not a matter of if, but when and how to prepare. As with any mineral resource, we first go after oil that's cheapest and easiest to find and extract. When this highest quality oil is used up, production slows, then declines, and may continue to tail off for many decades. This effect is seen in both individual oil fields and a country's total oil extraction rate. For most of the last century, the U.S. was the undisputed champion of oil producers. For decades, we produced half the world's oil and were the world's foremost exporter but our discoveries of oil began to dwindle back in the 1930s and U.S. production hit its maximum in 1970. It has never recovered. We live in a post-peak oil country. After the 1970 domestic peak and the oil shocks that followed, we learned hard how dependent we were on oil imports. So we started exploring for more oil at home, and we found an enormous amount in new oil provinces in Alaska and the Gulf of Mexico. Those oil fields helped turn production around for a few years at a time during the past three decades. But Alaska itself is now in steep decline, and we're currently relying on the oil in the Gulf of Mexico to make up for falling output elsewhere. In the past decade, the U.S. has doubled its number of drilling rigs, but still, deep water production from the Gulf of Mexico has plateaued and will start to decrease within the next few years. What if we drill in Anwar and off the coasts of California and Florida that are currently off limits? Let's use Department of Energy Reserves figures for those regions to see how long it would take to bring that oil to the market and how much difference it would make. In 20 years, we could gain a couple of million barrels a day in production, which could be sustained for two decades or so. But by that time, production from our other fields would have fallen by about half. The result would be far from enough to end our dependence on imports, even temporarily. We wouldn't even be able to return to the level of domestic production we enjoy today. Meanwhile, the same thing is happening to other oil-producing nations. Britain and Norway found a treasure trove of oil and gas in the North Sea in the 1970s, but production peaked for them at the beginning of this decade. Already Britain has returned to being a net oil importer. In fact, Chevron, the International Energy Agency, and the U.S. Department of Energy say most countries are likewise seeing falling production. Every year there are fewer oil exporters and more oil importers. Sometimes novice commentators talk about peak oil as if it were a problem with oil reserves, but that's not accurate. Reserves can be estimated generously or conservatively, depending on what's counted and who's counting. Instead, peak oil is about production flow rates, and those can be measured accurately. Does this mean that we are at the peak of global oil flow rates now? Not necessarily. There are large new production projects coming online this year and next, including one in Saudi Arabia that will add several hundred thousand barrels a day to that nation's productive capacity. On the other hand, there are some new problems. Russia, now the world's foremost oil-producing nation and the country that's been responsible for much of the world's oil production growth over the past decade, has entered its terminal decline. Other important exporting nations like Nigeria and Mexico are also in trouble. The industry is always finding new oil, but discoveries have been decreasing since about 1964. This is not a couple of years of bad luck. It's a well-established trend. Even when a sizable new oil field is found these days, it is almost always in ultra-deep water or another area that poses enormous technical challenges. Some economists say that these high prices are largely due to the falling value of the dollar or to speculation. 
Simple math tells us that dollar depreciation has added only 10 to 15 percent to oil's cost over the past two or three years. As for speculation, we have to ask, why are investors parking their money in oil contracts? It must be because they see the fundamentals supporting rising prices. Demand is rising and supply isn't. So speculation is a symptom, not the cause of the problem. Where is demand rising? In China and India, of course, but also in many of the oil exporting nations. Demand is rising at a rate of up to 7% per year in some of these nations. The reason is plain. With oil prices so high, these countries are earning record amounts of foreign exchange income, which is causing their economies to grow. When consumption expands at 7% per year, this means that it will double in just a decade. So even as the Saudis add new production capacity, in the short run, about the best they can do is keep up with domestic demand growth. For other producer nations, even if production can be kept flat, which in most cases it can't, their exports will decline. That's very bad news for the U.S. as we import almost two-thirds of the oil we use and are now competing with growing economies like China. World output of conventional crude has been flat for years now. However, with exports, we can already see the beginning of a downward slide. If current trends continue, exports could decline by half within a decade. This means we could face not just high prices, but actual shortages. How serious a problem is this? The summary of the Department of Energy's study, known as the Hirsch Report, puts it like this. The peaking of world oil production presents the U.S. and the world with an unprecedented risk management problem. As peaking is approached, liquid fuel prices and price volatility will increase dramatically, and without timely mitigation, the economic, social, and political costs will be unprecedented. They use the word unprecedented twice. They seem to be implying that this is a bigger problem than the Great Depression or World War II. After all, oil is our primary national energy source. It provides just about all our transportation energy and also fuels industrial agriculture. They go on. Viable mitigation options exist on both the supply and demand sides, but to have substantial impact, they must be initiated more than a decade in advance of peaking. In other words, the market won't solve this problem on its own. Price signals from scarcity will come years and decades too late to help us adapt. It will take time and enormous amounts of investment capital to rebuild the energy and transport infrastructure of a country like ours. Currently, our national energy policy is to import ever more oil while complaining about having to do so and to hope for miracles. The alternative energy sources we're investing in will not provide us with the fuel quantities at a speed and scale that we need. We should be investing not a few hundred million here and there, but hundreds of billions a year. Yes, that's right, hundreds of billions. And even then, it is now clear that there is no way that we will be able to develop other fuels fast enough to make up for declining petroleum. And what about conservation? Of course we need to increase the fuel efficiency of our vehicles, but the sheer size of the problem and the short time we have to adapt mean that this effort will also be too little, too late. Instead, we need the level of response to meet the level of the crisis. Our current efforts are in the wrong direction. We've been spending hundreds of billions on expanding highways and airports, just as higher oil prices are assuring we will be using them less and less. We must change our priorities as a nation, and fast. We must shift into crisis mode as we did with the New Deal and the war effort in the 1940s. Serious fuel shortages may or may not appear this year or next, but they are inevitable within a very few years. To prepare, we need plans for fuel rationing. We need a strategy to keep emergency and food delivery vehicles on the road and to provide winter heating oil to the Northeast while we make longer-term arrangements to reduce our need for oil. Is what we are doing to mitigate climate change enough to solve the peak oil problem? Not by a long shot. We at Post Carbon Institute believe that climate change is the greatest environmental challenge in our species' history. 
But because some of the worst impacts are likely to appear decades from now, from a policy perspective, it constitutes a moral dilemma. Peak oil presents us with more than a moral imperative. This is not about what we should do to save the polar bears. It's about what we must do to manage an unfolding national calamity. The disaster is already upon us, worsening by the year, the month, the day. We can survive this long emergency, as we did previous national crises, but it will take courage and effort. If you are starting to feel really concerned about this problem, rest assured that you are in good company. Others who are speaking out about the oil supply crisis include the officials at the International Energy Agency, the CEO of the European oil company Total, and major figures within the oil industry. Sweden has recognized the perils of oil dependency and depletion and has made it a national priority to become petroleum-free by 2020. Here in the US, an increasing number of legislators and other policymakers are working to develop responses to peak oil. Cities are empanelling peak oil task forces and working out plans for oil reduction in their transport and food systems. Please take the time to learn more about peak oil and how to develop policies that enable our nation to quickly reduce its dependence on depleting petroleum. Post Carbon Institute is working to identify policies that we believe will help both over the short term and the long term. Policies like the Oil Depletion Protocol, and programs like post-carbon cities. If you're a legislator, you can help by creating or joining a bipartisan peak oil caucus within your legislative body. Peak oil is not a partisan political issue. It is a survival crisis that affects us all. We must come together as a nation to quickly end our addiction to oil. As the International Energy Agency puts it, we must leave oil before it leaves us.